Thank you all for joining us. We're super excited to have you here for our first 2024 Cabin Fever series. Uh, we're going to be really blessed to be able to hear from Sam Chapman all about alewives. I'm super excited about it because I need to learn about it. I'm brand new. My name is Dr. Sarah Oktai, and I'm the new executive director for Herring Gut Coastal Science Center. Super excited to be here. We have a lot of great new programming this year. We've already got all our classes set up at both in class and on site, and we are raring to go. We hope to see you all at fo uh, following um, Cabin Fever Series and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Come stop by, we've got our touch tank up and running and we can give you a tour and we have a ton of summer programming. So if you go to our website at herringgut.org, you'll find all of our programs and you can start registering for summer programs for K through 12, for high school, see what kind of community um, trips we're going to do and just come visit us and stay involved. Thank you so much. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Elena and Sam, who've been working very hard to prepare this great talk for you today. Thank you, Sarah. Welcome, Sam. It's great to have you here. Everyone, this is Sam Chapman. He is an expert in shellfish hatchery, and he's going to tell us about that. We'll do this like conversation style back and forth a little bit, and I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. And welcome to Herring Gut. So have you been here before? I think everyone in this room has been here before. So we are pretty close to Marshall Point Lighthouse. And in this gut, this waterway between Hupper Island and the mainland, there used to be many, many herring and a very large fishery that looked something like this, painted by N.C. Wyeth in 1925. Today, our working waterfront is still going strong, just like that. And this center, Herring Gut, has been here oh, for 25 years. Phyllis Wyeth began the center as a place for youth to learn about coastal trades and careers and the fishing industry and be able to stay and not move away. So our mission is educating students and communities about the connections between the ocean, inland waters, and economy of Maine. And within that mission, one of our programs is Cabin Fever. So welcome to our Cabin Fever series with Sam Chapman. He'll be presenting about alewives. And the first question I have for you, Sam, is you are regarded as a leading expert in hatchery shellfish culture. And I'll just repeat that again so that you all can hear it. Welcome. This is our Cabin Fever series here at Herring Gut. And this is Sam Chapman, and he's regarded as a leading expert in hatchery shellfish culture. So for those of us who might not be familiar with that, could you tell us what hatchery shellfish culture is? Oh, oh boy. <laughs> Spawning and culture small shellfish to be large enough to be two inches to put her on the bottom of the ocean, okay? That's basically what it is. There's a lot more involved in that. Um, it just doesn't take place like that. The, the large, let's, let's talk about oysters, okay? You're gonna pick it, they go out and pick larger oysters from a warm water that's been warmed for a, a long time, which allows those oysters to be spawning, okay? So you bring them out, you put them in a, in a tank, narrow tank, add water sometimes, add sometimes a little bit more warmth to it, cool it down, give it some warmth, then you'll start seeing sperm and eggs coming out, okay? And those eggs are connected and put in a big tank. They, they spawn, they hatch, I should say, and uh, once they start swimming, they are put in small trays, fine measure, measured trays. And 
raised, okay, until they get ready to the point where they are going to set. At that time, they go from swimming around, they want to stick on something, okay, which is what oysters do. Those oysters that are in there ready, they're put on, on, on trays or sometimes other, mm -hmm. other materials that they will stick to. But once they hatch, they are put in ta big, big tanks, lots of lots of buckets of them, and fed and cared for until they're about one millimeter. At that point, they can be put in outside trays, or they can be sold to people to raise. And that that whole process is not soon. It's you know, you're looking at something that's probably three weeks at this point. Maybe four weeks. Depend. It depends. So that's where the shellfish culture. That's how it is developed. And then you got you got clams. You got oysters. You got mussels. You got all kinds of things that that go through that process. So you've gotten to work with a lot of different kinds of animals, from bivalves to fish and hatcheries, yeah. right? Yeah. And you ran the Shellfish Hatchery and Aquaculture Development Laboratory at the University of Maine's Darling Reed Center for 20 years. So what was the biggest challenge you faced at Darling Reed Center? The biggest challenge. <laughs> okay. Okay, what was the biggest challenge? Three summers season spent with scallops and nothing to be produced. And it was at the very, very end of the third year that any came out, but nothing developed from that. So it was the next year that the same process, each year something different changed. It looked like it was a better thing to do. And uh, we got we got some out, out of millions of eggs. We come out with maybe thirty two that su survived and lived on the side of the tank. I got them out, and in another three years, okay, they were growing enough to spawn. And mm, what was I going to say? Some things I don't say because no one else knows about it. But the tanks, we had two two tanks, and there were tens of thousands and more scholars that had grown in there and they sat. The first they'd never been done before like that. It hadn't worked out. So I was really pleased that I was there. Uh, with all that work, it finally came through, and it's it's there. And other people, you know, are being hacked on. How do you do this? And then, you know, uh, some things I keep to myself, but it's possible to do. We had we had tanks. They're, they're three feet by four feet, and there were four of them, and they looked like sandpaper. There were so many of them on that on that bench. So that if, if you want to know what was my biggest challenge, it was that. Of, of all the other things, they would go through what you wanted to do and, and came right off the other side, like oysters or uh, clams was a big deal. But uh, that was the biggest thing for me. So it took them about three years to grow <clears throat> big enough to put out? No, the, 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 first, okay, the first three years was nothing. And it was the next, well, at, at the next year, I got maybe thirty-two or so live scallops, okay, and raised those, and uh, we started getting oysters. I mean, uh, scallops. So that's how it happened. Six years. Hmm? Six years. Yeah. Easily six years. And I have one more question about your background before we transition into alewives specifically. Yeah. 
So you helped design seven marine laboratories in Maine and New Hampshire. So what was involved in making those elaborate designs? And we do have something that we could pass around for people to look at here too. So we have some, these are blueprints, right? Yeah. So we can pass these around in a little bit, but basically Sam helped to design this laboratory. And which one is this? This is Beals Island Regional Shellfish Hatchery. So you got to- Actually, it's the other two or three. The other two or three. The other, the other two or three, not- Oh, not this one. It was, Right. This this was done, and I I was given that. Oh, okay. The, the other ones are the ones that I get involved. Okay. In. I'm, I'm, Can I just pass these around though, so they could yeah. see what it kind of involved when you yes. were yeah. making designs? So similar to these are designs the same. They made this exact one. So what's one example of one of the hatcheries that you designed? Say that again. What is an example of one of the hatcheries that you designed? Boy, oh boy, I forget the name of it. It was uh, just a second down in it's the college in, in Brunswick. Boating. Huh? Boating. Boating. Yeah. They they put a lab, made a lab and they wanted it uh, set up. And we, I had been working with a group, three, three other engineers, uh, and putting together what you're given this and what goes in it. And it was, it was me that just, you know, showed them what is the best thing to do to get the water that they wanted to keep it clean and all that kind of thing. So uh, that was a that there was two, three of those that we that we did in the in the long run. So you got to decide where all the tanks went, where all the piping and valves went for the water intakes and outlets. How it was right? done, what to use, what kind of plastic, those kinds of things. So there's yeah. a lot involved yeah. in that. Yeah. One, I, I will say that, that you might want to know this, is that one of the most important things is when you're dealing with fisheries or anything in tanks, keeping the bacteria down is a huge Thing to, that you need to know about. If you there was a there was a time when uh, hatcheries were losing the, the, the critters they were raising in tanks were dying, and it was because of the bacteria that was in there. Where the bacteria come from? Lots of people had had uh, pipe, pipe piping overhead that was never clean hardly at all. Only when it's when it clogged got clogged up and they had to clean it out a little bit. Was the the, the uh, methods of cleaning that was 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 developed and it worked very well for us and other people came in to look at what we did. But this was the whole country had problems that way, and the Dallin Center and was one of three, and I was in part of the Dallin Center that worked with the people that understood that this was happening and that's how it all started Damn it. that way. Well, thank you for sharing about yeah. your background. So we're transitioning into our topic of the day, alewives, and we have one up on our screen, Alosa pseudo harangus. So how does, what, what makes the alewife special? How is it different from other fish? First of all, has everyone heard of an alloy? That's probably why you came here. Right. Well, it really is what is an alloy? Okay. Okay, we start, start with that. It's one of several fish that live on the ocean, in ocean water, fall, fall to spring, then returns to ponds and lakes to spawn their eggs in waters that respond that they respond in. Adult alewives start going back to the ocean by midsummer. Alewives like the ocean. Excuse me. Alewives live in the ocean for three years before they 
return to the ponds and lakes they were hatched in. Some elwives are known to spawn up to seven years in age. Okay, then there are 10 fish that are anadromous in Maine. Uh, this means that they live in the ocean and they come back to the freshwater to spawn. There were elwives, stripped bass, rainbow smelt, Atlantic salmon, blueback heron, American shad, sea lamprey, Atlantic sturgeon, and Atlantic tomcod. And there you don't, the only ones I've seen are the, the elwives, the blue and the regular elwives. And you just mentioned the blueback herring, and yeah. we have a picture that shows the difference, which it's a little bit fuzzy, but alewives usually have a bit deeper or taller of a front section right here compared to the bluebacks, but they're very, very similar. So while they're migrating, it's yeah. hard to tell them apart. So the alewive and blueback herring differences Spawning elwives spawn May to mid June. Blueback are from May to June. I've seen this happen. Okay, so it was the end. The elwives had gone. It was be, the you know the end of June, and they had they had left completely. And then one afternoon, I was down at the falls, up the falls, and honest to God. The L, the bluebacks were, were so thick, like that, you, you didn't see any water. They were all like this, and they're, they're up out of the water, so many of them. But none of them went up through the falls. So they don't go up. That's, that's a big difference. They swim to river. They swim up river. The alewives swim up river to spawn in plant growing areas close to the shore. Some people have called me up before. What's going on? Something is bothering these fish. No, they're up there. They're spawning in the evening. Blueback alewives spawn in mainstream areas of rivers and streams and do not use ponds. That's, that's in there. And alewives carry a mussel larva. It's called the alewife floated. That's what I, that's right. It doesn't sound right, but, but I'll, and, and it's dropped into ponds and lakes. It's the only way that they can get up there. And I've, I've seen it, I, I was raising shad, and sometimes these shad that would come in as, as broodstock, they would do as, this, you bring 80 of them up, there's always three or four dead ones in the, in the tank, so you, I'm always checking them out. If you look underneath, underneath here, they, some of them were not white, white colored underneath. They look like this. There's so much, so many of those in there. So, so anyway. they carry them under the gill flap, right? Yeah, like under the operculum. Yeah. You can see, you can see them. I think that's a tidewater musket. I think that's what that muscle is called. Okay, so I just wanted to. Get the close up back onto you for people at home too. And then, hang on, adjusting the view, put it back like this. Okay. At any time, if you have a question, be, be my guest. <laughs> so, Sam, you talked a little bit about the migratory journey of alewives going from saltwater to freshwater. So, during that time, as they're going through different ecosystems and encountering animals, how important are they to other animals? Do they interact with them? <laughs> you want to know about the animals that eat elwha? Is that what you're asking yes. about? I'm ready. Animals that eat elwives. Seabirds, bald eagle, osprey, blue heron. Gulls, terns, otter, mink, fox, raccoon, skunk, 
weasel, fisher, and turtles. So if they go on, I've seen this take place in the narrows of a stream going through the woods, going up through another pond. You can, there's dozens of them, pieces of them. They're taking the inside. They're not eating the whole fish and the, and the, the meat. They're eating what's the eggs and, and the down inside of them. And boy, do they smell. And as, as the season goes on, it's rotten. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they've been yeah. known as a keystone species because of how many different animals eat them. Yeah. That's 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 just the way it is. And yeah. what do they do for the salmon? You mentioned something to me in the past where when the salmon are migrating in the opposite direction. I've never I've seen one salmon in my life. I was I was this is like almost dark. Green had turned to black at that time at the bottom of the falls. And I'm looking across there. I was thinking at the time, how do I tell if I've done been successful doing this this kind of thing with the yellow wires and um, and and I said, if I can see a salmon go up those falls, I'll be successful. Okay, and I'm, I'm this is true story. I'm looking, and all of a sudden, here's this fish. It's at least thirty two to thirty four inches like that. And it was about yay deep like that with a flat tail. And so I, <laughs> it gave me an idea of what it was. It came up out of the water about four feet and it went into the water that slash, slashes down the center of the falls. And I'm, I'm watching to see because the water comes out, there's a pocket and it comes up like that. I'm going to see if he comes back down through. He never came back through. The, the water is only about, I'm going to say four feet wide at the most, but there's a lot of fast water coming down this four to six, eight inches. That fish went right up through there. So I did see a salmon. It's exciting. So I felt successful about it after after that. What river was that? What? What river? This is Madomic. This is in Waldeburg. Really? Everything I did is in Waldeburg. Yeah. And then while those salmon are migrating, I know that you saw that one special one, yeah, but when yeah. they're all migrating together, I think you told me that the alewives travel above them in the water, so they oh, offer okay. the, the, protection, the, the, right? Okay. This this comes under what are one of the uses, the, the good okay. things about alewives. One one of them that is uh, quite well known is that in the springtime, when the alewives are coming up through. The salmon, the young salmon, are coming back down through on the bottom, and the the elwhite is swimming on the surface, and it gives a a better chance of the uh, salmon making it down underneath the elwhites because all the whatever's eating on the fish in the water are taking the stuff that's on the surface like that, and they get used to it, and that's what it's what they're looking for, and it gives the salmon an opportunity to make it out. So they offer protection yeah, that, to other species. That's protection, yeah. That's really cool. And you've mentioned how important alewives are historically. So can you tell us a little bit about the connection to the past and possibly to Native Americans and how they harvested? Yeah, give me just a second. Well, we've gone by some things I gave it. So let's let's so, first talk about the, the population of alewives in Maine. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> Maine historical thriving pollution pop population has plummeted in the has plummeted in the last two centuries. Dams, pollution. And overfishing has taken a toll on them. Presently, offshore bottom netting accounts for more than 90% of the caught alewives. This, this is, they're fishing for one thing, and the alewives are in there with them and they're catching them. Okay. Historians and scientists tell us prior to European settling in the region, 
There was not a stream flowing out of a lake or pond in the Gulf of Maine that didn't have an annual alewife migration unless it was brought by passable waterfalls. One early historian said there can have there can have been hardly an accessible pond in the whole state that did not have a visit. Of all the migratory fish that came into the main rivers, elwives were the most abundant. One history of garden, Gardner and Pittston, written in 1852, relates that elwives are so plentiful that in the time the country was settled, that bears and later, later swine feed on them in the river. They were crowded ashore by the thousands. That gives you an idea of what's taken place way back then. Okay? As populations grew, and businesses developed near rivers, electricity needed, electricity need from dams, and early factories needed river water, and wasted chemicals were dumped into the rivers. Elwives and other fishes could not make it up to ponds and lakes to spawn. Recently, large deep water draggers with nets are capturing elwives along with the fish that is being trapped in all of these things have to do reduce have and do reduce elwife development in Maine. Uh, that's, that's what's going on. If you ask why has the number of fish dropped down, it's these things. And I, I, was, I have seen what happens to a, a, a major river down halfway down the country here. It was like, I'm gonna say four to seven miles of no oxygen in that water for what was coming out of the city. And they had to make a, this is like in the 70s when, when it became important to fix the water, okay, they clean it up. And it made a big difference. And, this, and the fish started going up, 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 way up into the States and af after that. Big deal, okay. So it sounds like there were possibly millions of fish if you add up all those thousands before yeah, yeah. industrialization, but then all the dams yeah. stopped most of them. And from my understanding, it's like a 99% decrease in the population of alewives in Maine over 200 years time. Yep. But are people doing anything to so, help but, this? <laughs> the answer is yes. And um, the, the state is, is working. They have some of their own projects. In, in local areas in, in central Maine. And uh, I met with people that are working in, in the Bangor area, okay, up, up that way, and then down and then down east. The the uh, business that is raising uh, salmon down east. And uh, they've done this for years. They've been successful at doing what they need to do to to get the salmon back into the into the ponds, and they're realizing that they're the uh, goodness of elwives, and they are now working on di this different ponds, not different, different streams that they're working on. I don't know which ones they are, but I know what's going on. There's a big movement to move the dam out of Ellsworth. So they, at, at some way, they're going to have it opened up. Either they're going to take the dam down, or they're going to have something built that the elwives can go up in. Uh, so, so the answer is yes. There are. I don't know what's going on down further down on the on the state, but I'm sure something is here and there because there's people like me and you, and you. <laughs> That, that realize that this is something that needs to be taken care of. Like everything else that's being changed to a more positive situation. Yeah. And I know there's an organization in Gardner called Upstream working on restoring fish passage for alewives. And some of the projects take 
up to 10 years or more to be able to design and build a fish ladder, for example, and get it installed and raise all the money to fund that. And last year, I believe it was, it was either one or two years ago, China Lake opened back up to fish, fish passage and had millions of alewives going into it for the first time in 200 years. Wow. So the first time since George Washington was president. They worked a <laughs> long, but they spent a lot of time and money on doing that. Yeah, they did. But it's so important, and, and not just for the animals, but for the people of Maine too, right? Yeah. So this is excellent. Yeah. And I have some photos that you shared. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about some of these photos. Yeah. I can explain okay. what is a photo you got on the That's That's the lower, lower stand in the town of Waldemar, just up above the river, the, uh, the the bridge that you drive over and you can look up there and see it. This is what it looked like for, I'm going to say centuries, right? This were, at one time, there were, there were different dams that had been built there. Most of them were made with wood. Okay? But anyway, now this is what I was involved in. And, and I, no one told me to do anything. I was interested in how this worked, whatever. So after years of watching the elevators come up through, some would go up through, and normally at that time of the year, there's no water coming down through here. So this would be like solid water. Very, very fast, very hard right there. And, and this is a, a narrow place, maybe 18 inches wide, coming down through there, even with a lot of water. And occasionally, as you stand there, you're going to see an one out life going up through. And then another one. Very through time, you see two going up at once. So at, the, at this point, okay, we hired someone to come in and do some, some digging and cutting and boom kind of stuff. <laughs> but it, it, OK, this was narrow. And eventually, this was cut down like this. There's pictures of it, okay, before and after. You've got some, you have some before and after pictures, okay. Oh, that no. wasn't mine. No, okay. And, and now, this is what happens, is, is that water, no matter what's going on, and even if it goes down, there's a lot of water coming down through here. And you can see anywhere from five to seven fish at a time one right behind, they're all, you know, seven, seven, seven. Before it was just one here and one there kind of thing. It made a big difference. And something else that's very useful for people who want to enhance fish passage, okay, is bivalve development, okay, bivalve. You go over, you, I don't have the pictures, but over here, I do, I do. You do. <laughs> this is the upper falls. This is the, the deep falls over here. This is very, and, and this is this is the area that it was had open. Okay. At the same time, the bypass was. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Was built on the side and went up like that. And there was a puddle that lived up here. They said, "You don't know what you're doing." That's not going to work. You know? So we get that first time they come up through here. He's down there telling us what to do. We do you do this so you don't come back again. Kind of situation. Like, okay. Yeah. You know, he was down there one evening, okay? And he's watching this. And I come down. He says, you know, I said, I just counted 144 elves coming up through there in one minute. This is coming up through the bypass. That you can see this was would have been going very heavy too. Wow. Okay. <laughs> no, I I I did I did get him. It wasn't that way. But it was a situation that was not easy to work with. But anyway, this this worked out very well. Okay. Again, this is Madonna River in the Walden. And the the, the the river comes up and it opens up like that. And I, I think that sometime in, in, in history, they dug a hole, they dug a, a, a V-shaped 
Let them open these slots for that. But there's so much water coming through here, and it comes down, and it goes down like that. Very high for the elevators to come up, but that's where they went at one time. So now we were in, I had high school kids working with me, put a, put a little bypass way, way down here for them to come up through. Yeah, it worked some. It worked better than the way it was before. So we went in and, and put a board in and connected the water. And some water was coming down this way and some was coming down that way. We went in and, I, and, and the, the problem in the world, and the, every year you could look down, lift by 200 yards down the road until it, until it comes around. And it was just solid LWARS like that. And they were, they were, they, they were the LWARS, they were coming up, and there some, they were coming up kind of, kind of like that. You know? They just, they just some of the guys for real, and some of them going up through there. Had a hard time getting up through there. So we worked with the Davis fish trucks from town, and they provided funding for the uh, they made a, a uh, made a what? They opened up the waterfall coming down through here, make a nice little dam form to come down through. And it was supposed to be maybe three feet, but when they got done, it was like eight feet. It was good. And and um, okay, we, we did that okay, and that, and at the same time, me and another fellow got together and we built another bypass. That bypass, as soon as it was done, okay, they were coming up to the they were coming up to the and this worked out <clears throat> very well. There was a lot of water coming down through there. And, and then we found one one area coming up through the, 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 the ledges, ledges like this. And it was only about that wide, and that was causing a problem. So I got one up of the town guys, they had this gear, they can they want to. And they did the command, and they and, and they opened it up to about 18 to 20 inches like that. And and because it took this ledge, this piece of ledge off like that. It was it was open all the way down. Like it was like that, and it was like that. And all of a sudden, if you look down there, you don't see much. You don't see the bottom at all. So it's all elbows like this coming out through. So the point the point in all this is that you can you can do things. We spent fourteen thousand dollars. There was a lot of big work that went on. There was a lot of time that. That it was kind of this out and doing all this thing. Anyway, this has, has been very, very useful for the elements. And, and if, 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 if you can go in all the world and you can you can drive up the road, you can stop, and you can walk down to these ledges. Be careful because you can fall in. <laughs> but you can see. I, 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 in the beginning of the year, you, if you look down, you don't see you don't see any down through the water. It's all solid L watch. And one of the things that takes place is in the day in a day, you can see fish down about this far. Oh well, actually flat down this far. Okay. The next day they're gone. Okay. They will build, build back up right there. And like overnight, this whole bunch of fish, instead of having 200 yards of solid fish down here, there's a few here, and then the lot or something. So it pays to do this. And it's a small, small, little small town, but it works really well. When was that done? What year? I have I have the cost on it somewhere. I don't know. I'm what you're looking at. 15 years ago. Okay, yeah. In that time frame. Yep. It was, I can't remember if it was there going on or you were there or not. I don't remember. Yeah, that makes sense. I think it was just done before you got here. Yeah. Questions? The more you can do in a, in a local town, 
even if you only go out with a hammer and go like that and open it up, I've seen that. <laughs> no, I've done it before. I've, there's this one place that was open, a little bit of water coming up through, and, and I, I did it until I just couldn't do it anymore. And it didn't amount to much. But then you start seeing fish, one will jump up here. Nothing was going up before, but one would jump. They, you give them an inch, and they'll take three feet, 330 feet. <laughs> what is something? Say, they, what, what does Madonic mean? The end of the water. The, the, I, think, I think it's got to do with the, it's where salt water stops and fresh water begins. Am I right? I thought it was River of Many Alewives. Yeah, that's what I was told. Yeah. I had not, I had not, I had not heard that. I heard the other one. Right. Kind of... Who knows? You know, someone just wrote it down. Uh, you're know. welcome. <laughs> to... <laughs> what I'm told. Call it what you want. <laughs> okay. And I have some more photos that you can yeah, share with them. This this is what was built to. Count the other ones with. You've seen, okay, you you know one more, the next one. That's that's what that's the beginning right there. Okay. And that's putting it together like this. And then the bridge is up here. And people were asked to stand there and count them as they go through. But one of the things, go to the next one, please. Okay, you, you can you can see how this is open like this. The first day we did this, the elves. I mean, it was black with fish going up through. How in, how can you possibly count fish that they're all solid like that? They didn't work. So what we did is we cut two holes in this. This material was four inches by two inches and four inches by two inches, and that would I mean the. the Behind us, off the bridge, could be solid with fish at times, and that held them back. And and there would be, there would be you know eight or sometimes twelve going up through there. But you can lots of lots of people just stood there and laughed like that. What did I say? There was like I wanted to say eight thousand in an hour kind of thing. That's, that's, that's how it went. Nowadays, they got the electric stuff they went down in. I don't know how that how that worked, how it works. I know bass like to sit in them anyway, that kind of thing. I don't remember how long that lasts. But, but in, in doing something like this, by the way, I have that if someone needs it, okay, to use. This is about three feet or so deep. It's got weights underneath it. And what was I going to say about that? It, it worked its way up, and eight feet from, from that, the whole thing comes together and it angles up because this is floating. It's something that is possible for like, anyone here, not just you. But it's going to be have to be, it always takes several people to work on this. It's like, Two of us, and at some time in the three of us, I had to go down every morning in, in a situation like this before anything got more because plants and pieces of stuff that can come washing down and get caught on this. And what happens is it doesn't take much on the bottom for that thing to pick up and it opens right up the, on the bottom. So you gotta, you can't just let it go by itself. This is, I, I, Philip Reed was a fisherman, and I, I got personal reasons how I got to know him through, through my hatchery. And he could, he, he would take this and before we used it in the spring and, and fill in the holes. You, you, you get holes in it. Uh, Philip Reed. You already did that. Okay. So you're talking about the bypass. This, this okay. location. This, this is this is where the bypass starts down here. Goes up and comes and th this is all ledge and pieces. There's a little bit of a you know a cradle in there, but 
this had to be, this was a cop down through here like that. It was about 16 to 18 inches wide and 16 to 18 inches deep. And it, you could see all the water, the water was down on them. If you open some water up and it's straight, it's easy for them to come up through. Then they're going to be more wanting to do it. Um, this was clear, cleared out down to here. And the first, I, I can tell you, the, the next spring, the raft of this was done, this was all gold coming down in here. l had gone up through and they, they had to sit in, the, in over here where it, op it opens up and like a little pond, not a little pond, but it is brush, brush running fast. It's just a lot of water coming down through. And this was age. I got pictures of the age everywhere coming down through here like that. And they stuck on the ground out in here. What? A large and smelt. And is this the Madomic River also? This is the Madomic River. This is down, this is where the water was coming down. We were looking at it over here. Okay. That's, yeah, that's what it is. And if you. Oh, did you want me to go back? Yeah, so, I mean, wait, wait, wait a minute. Yeah, th this this is the guy drilling the holes to blow it up. It would not it come up through here like this, and it came up around to way over here. I see. I had that covered in so they could they could cut this down and come down through. When they got down, this was this is it's open from here to here. It doesn't really make a difference. Looks like a lot of work, but it sounds really worth it. It was fun watching it. <laughs> <laughs> and when it goes off, it's boom. It wasn't really pow. It was boom. And it went up. It went up about twelve feet like that. There was I can't imagine the the hundreds and hundreds of pounds of plastic material, no, rubber material they had laying there. Made out of the tires. Anyway. Okay, that's what that's what it looked like when they got done. The, the stuff is here, but it's all cracked down. Okay, where are we now? That's what the falls look like. Don't remember. Yeah, the, this has been this has been cut, and they got that space that's coming down through there like that. There's so many pictures I have. <laughs> and this one is this? Devis Scott. Okay. And that is one of the most pleasant places to go down there and look and see what they've done. It's made a big difference for the fish coming up through. And in the spring, we do want to- This is Okay, so this is, is the, back to Walterboro. Th this is the upper falls. It's, Okay. In, in in the Madama River, I mean Madama on, and there's another one that goes off to the east. Um, it's about a, a mile. Goes in and goes up to the little Madama pond, and that's there's a, there's a road with the yeah with a hole through there, okay, and that's what goes up. And, and way, I mean, you're know, probably 200 yards off the big pond into the stream. And they were going up to you like that. And how many would you say? Would you say that's thousands or millions? Oh, there were thousands that go up through there. Wow. And it's, it's one of the nicest things to, to be involved in, especially it's like 10 o'clock in the morning, you're going upstream, there's one place where it, it goes up like that, and there's all these rocks, and, and the stream is made a little, a little pond, a little bubble here, and you jump up, and there's another one. 10 o'clock in the morning, the sunlight is coming down, and there's plants growing there like that, it was beautiful to see. And, and they were doing some, they were good for them, and it makes the people, me and the other guys that, that worked on this, to, to be there to see that. And I, it's one of these things that's to be in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So there are a couple more photos and we can give people a chance to ask you questions oh. too. The next photos are showing some harvesting and smoking of the ale lives. Okay, hey, got about 10 minutes, so. They're not hard to deal with. <laughs> it, it the, the hardness is getting the funding that you need if you need it and, and locating a half a dozen people that want to do what you want to do. And is this a smokehouse in Waldeboro? <laughs> <laughs> Where did you get that? Those are the ones you shared with me. That's an outhouse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought it looked like... No, no, no. It, it, it was when we first went there and it turned into a chicken pen. Okay. Well, that's was... more for smoking. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> So what did you do here? Okay. I'm smoking a little Is okay, that's good enough. It doesn't you don't have the ones of the fish themselves, but they look um, like the individual fishes. Yeah, that's one. There should be another one that's opened up. No, it's okay. All right, you can go back. Okay. I'm smoking L wives. <laughs> That's where I met her. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. Baltimore right? Town Festival, yeah. That's, and he yeah. was smoking the ale lives and you could eat them. They're delicious. Yeah. But they didn't last a year in the freezer. Oh. Oh, they're, they're there. You can eat them, but it's like chewing. I don't know. <laughs> what are they? Oh, oh. I, I think they dried out and, and the flavor was lost. But anyway, you know. Well, well, if anyone has any questions for Sam, yep. we have time. If you have things for them, what's the what's the current commercial like? Uh, oh my gosh, industry. What's the commercial industry for alewives now? Somewhere I got it right here. Dream. Maine's economy. Is that what you're talking about? Not a lot. <laughs> there are 35 marine municipals, municipalities that have commercial harvesting rights to alewives on 39 streams and rivers. These runs provide revenue to towns, many of which lease their fishing privileges to independent fishermen. Many of the fishways built for Elwives restoration on some of the smaller coastal streams are partially funded by these municipalities because they recognize the value of the native fish species. That's the what we had in Wallaver, the Davis Trust Elwives program. An important commercial fishery in the Atlantic Ocean is supported by Elwives. They are packaged fresh, smoked, salted, or pickled for human food and often sold as river herring. Elwives also provide bait for the main lobster industry. And that's a big deal. Uh, uh, I didn't know these other things until I got reading, checking things out. And the lobster industry, I was, I'm trying to, it's thousands of you know, millions of pounds of fish that are involved in this. So it's a big, it's a big deal. Thank you, Sam. And does anybody at home on Zoom or in your office on Zoom, do you have any questions for Sam? You could put it in the chat or just unmute yourself. Yeah. Who's from, who's from Warren? Is there someone from Warren? No. Baltimore. Baltimore. I have a quick question. Um, earlier you mentioned uh, the importance or the key of shellfish in relation to the allies. I just wasn't sure what the what the connection was there. Between the L, I mean, allies and and yeah, fish. 
if I'm not mistaken, you mentioned earlier about five valves, I think. Yeah, this and is the, wise, and I was wondering what that connection was. Well, I was I was asked to come out with some of something about me that people would understand and what I do, what I did to get to be where I am. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. So it was no, there's no connection that I can say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's you are the connection. <laughs> <laughs> Are they still doing the fish count on Madonna? They, they did. They the did season? last year. I, 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 I don't know. The heavy spring rains kind of messed with the equipment, so they didn't get as accurate as they wanted. Yeah. But it was electronic this year. Oh, okay. So, you know, technology is great when it works, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the heavy, heavy rains we had was a little too much for it. Yeah. yeah. When I was doing it, it was a daily thing. Sometimes it was twice in the day. Wore up my day, my diving suits, sitting on the bench down there. But uh, so it, it's something that needs to, anything you do with the fish, whether it's upstream, downstream, on falls. You've got to be there in the springtime and check where the, the stones will move down through, and you've got to watch how things are set up that you've had it doesn't just happen all by itself all the time so there's a you you get to be involved in taking care of it that's like having a garden not getting the best stuff out of it you know yeah. I, if anyone wants contact but I, my phone number is 542-6799. And you can reach me at samchat at roadrunner.com. You may not get an answer the first day. <laughs> Would you like me to type that into the chat? Hmm? Would you like me to type that into the chat for people at home? Thank you, Sam. This was really, this was really cool. Very interesting. Yes. I'm glad yeah. that you were able to make the time. And Sam's been providing a lot of uh, curriculum and actual analogs to us for educational purposes. So he's been a great resource for her and guests. And we're very grateful for everything that you brought and shown us and uh, contributed, so he's a font of not only knowledge, but stuff. Mm -hmm. He's got some beautiful pictures actually on a carousel mm -hmm. and digitizing things. Mm -hmm. What else has Sam brought you for some of your yeah. classes? Well, a lot of research from the local area on alewives and shellfish and plankton. And so that's been interesting to be able to look through. And I think it'd be great to utilize some of that with our classes, especially our new middle school and high schoolers, because we can use some graphs, have them analyze and interpret that data as well. And you had an idea similar to our idea for the spring is to go on a field trip and take people to Gamerscotta Mills Fish Ladder and possibly Walderboro to be able to see the fish migrating in late May, early June. Can you talk a little bit about fresh to salt? Because some of this feeds into that program. I can. So we have a watershed education project for middle school students and teachers. We train the teachers in the summertime, in the middle of August, for three days. They get a kit, and then they bring that back to their classroom, and they have some indoor lessons, some outdoor lessons, and some field excursions where they can sample the water quality, learn about LY's migratory journey and their connections through the different ecosystems flowing from fresh to salt water. And there's a lot of cultural and historical connections to make, so it's a, an integrated lesson journey through learning about alewives wives yeah. for the first unit. If you can look up for a, it's a, eight, was it 1874? That's what yeah, you're there's, a, there's a picture, okay? It's a, of, of L wives being dipped out of the river in, in it's 17, no. No, 17. Yeah, 1774. 1874. Is it 18 or 17? Can't remember now. I think it could be 18. 
But anyway, the show guys with dress suits on. <laughs> you know, you guys don't fool me off. But they're digging, they're catching their lives and they get them in the net and that kind of thing. But what I what I really have enjoyed is, is that looking at that picture, and I can see where they are, and I can see the ledges, okay? And I can go back there because of the ledges that are all shaped like this and whatever, I can go out there and be within at least six to seven feet of where that picture was taken. It makes me feel good to be able to do that. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could just really quickly repeat your contact information okay. so I could put it in here. What is your phone number? Okay. What, my telephone? What's your phone number? 542. No, no, or Q. <laughs> it's my phone number, 5426799. And Sam Chat for phone, for, for the computer, mm -hmm. Sam Chat at Roadrunner. Runner. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> dot com. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sam. Stop okay. recording here. Cabin Fever will be February 11th and 12th. Is it the 12th? Yes, I'm not here, I believe. Okay. And who's the speaker for that? Um, it is Richard Bates. Yep. Um, and it's going to be about flooding and coastal flooding in Port Clyde and what the town of St. George um, is doing to prepare for the coastal flooding that clearly over the past.